Hello and welcome to our final capstone project on tight oil CO2 EOR in the cardium formation. Let's dive in by talking a little bit about the scope of our project. Cardium is an extensive formation that resides in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. Primary production began in the early 1950s and was shortly followed by water flooding. There are a variety of plays in cardium, however a large portion of oil exists in an unconventional environment such as tight oil. Recent advancements in multi-stage hydraulic fracturing and enhanced oil recovery has garnered the attention of some firms for utilizing these advancements in cardium. The cardium in Pembina is composed of two lithostratigraphic units, the upper cardium zone member and the lower Pembina river member. Reservoir-like qualities are found in the latter member as the former is primarily composed of shale. The area we used for data collection was chosen such that enough information can be gathered to create a realistic geological model. Data collection comprised of logs, routine core, special core, fluid analysis, PVT tests, and rock mechanics. The geological model encompasses our simulation model, which is located roughly in the center. The simulation model was chosen for its high concentration of multi-stage hydraulically fractured horizontal wells, making it extremely fitting for our project. Now let's talk petrophysics. The workflow needed to calibrate equations was to collect log and core data, perform gamma ray depth correction if necessary, obtain log parameters required for calibration, remove the outliers, fit the equations, then finally determine the unknowns. The grain density used was the typical sandstone density of 2.65 grams per cc. To confirm the validity of this number, we can plot the bulk density against the porosity, exclude the outliers, draw the best fit line and determine the intercept. With this, we found our matrix density to be fairly close to the commonly assumed density of sandstones. Total porosity is determined as the porosity summation of the isolated pores, which are assumed to be negligible for clastics, large pores which usually consist of mobile hydrocarbons and water, small pores which usually harbor immobile hydrocarbons or water, depending on the wettability, and the clay interlayers, which is home to the clay-bound water or the water bound to the surface of clay minerals. Since isolated porosity is negligible, Effective porosity is simply calculated as the total porosity less the clay-bound water. Accurately estimating effective porosity is easier said than done in many cases. The approach utilized in our project was to calculate the effective porosity from the shale volume formulation, the exchangeable cations formulation, and then taking the average of the two. Comparing the results of the formulations, we find that they are not too far off from each other, and we should therefore have no issues using the average. Clays have an innate ability that allows the passage of cations, a numerical value for this ion exchange capability is called the cation exchange capacity, or CEC. CEC analysis is valuable as it provides information on the potential presence of swelling clays and can aid in obtaining a more accurate water saturation. Wet chemistry CEC tests were conducted for five core samples. Results indicate an average value of 6.23 milliequivalents per 100 grams. Based on this low value, it can be assumed that the clay composition is predominantly kyalinite or iolite, as opposed to high CEC clays such as montmorillonite or smectite. This is confirmed from X-ray diffraction. Altogether, this implies clay swelling is a minimal concern for our sandstone in western Pembina. Many correlations exist that allow permeability estimation from logs. However, out of the variety, only the geological basis of the Yao Holditch model is similar to that of the tight cardium sandstone. Results show that we have a decently calibrated permeability equation, with a large cluster of values around the unity line. Due to the unconventional and shaly nature of the cardium tight sands, Archie's equation could not be relied upon to estimate the fraction of water occupying the pore space. In shaly sands, water saturation equations commonly fall under two criteria. Simpler models that are based on shale volume fraction and models that are based on the ionic double layer of bound water. We adopted the latter model in the form of the Waxman-Smith's water saturation equation. It is a semi-empirical extension of Archie's equation and accounts for the excess shale-induced conductivity. It has been successfully used for sandstones with laminated shales in other works. Similar to the permeability results, water saturation results show clear trends and a cluster of data points around the unity line. Based on contact angle tests and relative permeability crossover, we can confidently assume our reservoir is mixed to oil wet. Water flooding operations tend to underperform in oil wet reservoirs because water cannot penetrate the oil wet layers as easily due to capillary effects. Injected water flows through the middle of the pores while oil adheres and coats the grain surface. The time required for water breakthrough in an oil wet system is typically much shorter than that of a water wet system. Now onto the simulation side of things. After identifying our area of interest, we amalgamated well and core data and created a formation top contour. This information combined allowed us to create our initial model. The team used Gaussian geostatistical simulations to distribute the petrophysical data in a representative manner. It was then necessary to extract the true area of interest for simulation, as previously mentioned. The geological model contained 130 layers spaced 0.1 meters apart to match log data. This would not be feasible for reservoir simulation. 
Therefore, the model was uplayered to 7 layers while retaining the total thickness of 13 meters and the overall petrophysical distribution. Grid blocks were nulled out based on a porosity cutoff of 5%. This corresponds to the cutoff used for our reservoir characterization and volumetrics. To replicate the creation of hydraulic fractures and their effects in the subsurface, our project represents these fractures via a simulated reservoir volume, or SRV, approach that utilizes compaction dilation tables. The dilation tables are used in the slick water injection phase to alter the transmissibility values based on the pressure and fluid distribution. The fluid model was calibrated in wind prop to a high degree of accuracy to ensure there is no discrepancy between important parameters, such as the bubble point or the minimum miscibility pressure needed to achieve multi-contact miscibility. Simulation initialization shows we are on the right track with our original oil in place being under 1 percentage point difference from GeoScout and 6.5 points off from our volumetrics. Historical production was constrained to oil rate and no issues were encountered in obeying those constraints. Gas production, however, significantly deviated from our historical data. In order to match the gas production to history, we applied our engineering knowledge to increase the gas mobility. This was done by altering the relative permeability curves and adjusting the endpoints. Water flooding was simulated by switching two of the producers to injectors. The two wells were chosen such that each injector is situated between two producers. To allow a fair comparison, our second development scenario, CO2 Continuous Flood, was designed in a similar manner as the water flood. Both scenarios use a fluid injection rate of 25 meters cubed per day at reservoir conditions. Our final development scenario is Huff and Puff. Unlike recovery methods based on continuous operation, this method is split into three stages. CO2 is injected in the Huff stage for a period of time. This is followed by a soaking period to allow the CO2 to get situated with the oil. And the cycle ends with the puff stage where the well is switched back to produce reservoir fluids. Huffing and puffing times can vary significantly depending on the purpose and location, but it is common to use 30, 60, or 90 days. Soaking periods are more controversial. Some studies conclude that a few weeks are optimum, while others require longer times. In fact, some authors claim that a soaking period does not make much of a difference and is therefore not required. To remain in a safe range, we opted to use a soaking period of 7 days. The CO2 injection cycle we implemented was 30 days, while the production cycle was 90. As the CO2 interacts with the oil, it is important to consider miscibility and viscosity. Ideal CO2 injection occurs at pressures near or above the minimum miscibility pressure required to achieve multi-contact miscibility. This allows heavy and intermediate hydrocarbons to be produced in a greater fraction, whereas below that point we start to see larger production of the light components such as methane. As a side effect of CO2's miscibility with oil, oil viscosity decreases, as shown here, which increases oil's mobility and therefore production. Comparing overall production across the development scenarios, we see that every scenario has a better outcome than simply leaving the wells alone, as is done for the base case forecast. Water flooding is underperforming as is expected for oil wet reservoirs. CO2 continuous flooding shows great promise, however it is overshadowed by the performance of Huff and Puff. The surface facilities are generally designed to separate the effluent gases, primarily CH4 and CO2, from the produced liquid stream, and importantly, to sequester the effluent CO2 for re-injection into the formation. The surface facility can be broken down into the following components. Slug catchers, these provide the additional storage capacity necessary to contain the liquid surges, while also dissipating the energy surges generated by high-velocity liquid slugs. Free water knockout. This unit type is designed to mechanically segregate the bulk of the effluent water from the oil, which together enter the vessel as an emulsion. Demulsifier. Specialized chemicals are used in the demulsifier to break the water oil emulsions. Emulsion breaking chemicals are used to erode the oil film surrounding the water droplets, such that the film will break upon collisions between droplets. In most industrial and engineering applications, CO2 capture is carried out with the aid of specialized amines. One such amine is the DEA solvent which offers a number of advantages over analogs, especially in terms of its chemical stability and resistance to degradation. A typical DEA-based CO2 separation operation usually requires the flow gas stream to contact the DEA solution in an absorber. The DEA will then selectively absorb the CO2 before flowing into a regeneration column. The lean DEA solution is then recycled back to the absorber where this process is repeated. CapEx estimation for each scenario included drilling, completions, facility, pipeline, construction, and transportation. CapEx ranges from 2 million to 4 million, going from the base case to huff and puff. OpEx estimation included well operation, central process and facilities operation, supervision, and overhead. As evident, both CO2 EOR schemes are profitable, with huff and puff being declared the winner and the more economically sustainable option. Gas price changes yields negligible NPV response, 
NPV is expected to be most sensitive to changes in oil price. A takeaway from the sensitivity analysis, low operating costs yields high NPV indicating that operating costs can be optimized to improve NPV over time. One of the possible ways to lower operating costs is to streamline the management structure such that fewer intermediate decision-making layers are needed to meet the project deliverables. This will reduce the supervision, overhead, and administrative costs significantly, thereby contributing to the project's bottom line. We thank you for your time and hope you enjoyed our presentation and find it as interesting as we did. We look forward to any questions or feedback you may have.